Thank you, and welcome, everyone. It's really amazing to be here. As you've heard a few times, we're celebrating ten, the 10th ten London Calling, 10 years of nanopore sequencing applications, and also for me personally, 10 years since I started in the applications team in New York. I'm going to talk to you about a few of the applications we've done over these 10 years. A lot has happened, and we've seen some amazing progress. But more importantly, I'm going to talk about what I think the technology has enabled us to do now and what we'll be doing going forward. When MAP started 10 years ago, we basically said, here's a portable sequencer. What do you want to do with it? And we got hundreds of different applications that people wanted to do. In the applications team, we had the same opportunity. We were essentially working as a customer, but internally at Oxford Nanopore. Our job was to drive application innovation, but also focus on showcasing the technology and inspire customers. Now, throughout the years, it became very obvious that we did not have the subject matter knowledge that all our customers had. We learned with you, and we learned from you. And so now, the community has really come together. We work directly with our customers, and we are mutually inspiring each other. We're growing together. We're learning together to focus on success. So this is sort of a rough timeline of what's happened over the last 10 years, just a few highlights. I'm going to talk about a few today. I'm going to go a little bit back in time and mention some of the first experiments. But I'm also going to focus on what really can drive us going forward. I won't be able to talk about everything. There are a few highlights that I'm just going to pick up now. Um, Poor C is something that we worked on back in 2018 and published together with Marcin Mylinski at New York Genome Center. Um, I want to mention adaptive sampling, which was a, very much a community effort, um, which we worked on quite a bit at the time. And also something like single cell long read sequencing, which I won't get to talk about today. I actually missed the first of that because I was on maternity leave, um, but we've done a lot with it since. Some of the things that I don't get to talk about and some of the things that I do get to talk about are also in posters. You can find 10 applications posters out in the live lounge and also in the online platform. OK, but back where it all started. In September 2014, we did our first sequencing experiment in New York, and that was the Lambda Burnin, as it was known. This is the result we got. This was the R7 pore and 2D chemistry. Can anyone guess how many reads that was? Just shout a number. OK. Uh, eight, 688, which you know is not that impressive. Uh, still, there was a couple of those reads that was the full-length lambda phage genome. And even though the amount wasn't impressive, that to me was just mind-blowing. Like we had a whole genome's organ uh, the whole organism's genome presented in one read. And it just seems like the the possibilities were endless. Moving on a little bit, this was the first time we did human genetics. So this is a very small snapshot of a human gene, the CO1 gene. Uh, the single read accuracy for this particular length was uh, this piece of the genome was 84%. But the consensus accuracy was 100%. Now, this is a particularly easy part of the genome, the CO1 gene. But we used this because we wanted to lose, use, look at species identification. So in order to investigate if we could find what species were in a sample, we had to get a sample. So we went to a, a deli. This is a deli in New York where you might get your lunch. There's a buffet. And we looked at, and we took three different kinds of meat. So the point here was to use the CO1 gene to see if we could tell which, which meat it was. So we extracted the DNA. Individually, we were able to detect the, um, the meat that it was. And then we mixed them all together. And we were able to, with then even with an 84% accuracy, to tell these animals apart. Now, I should say that rabbit and rat weren't actually in the meat. Uh, that was spiked in, but the human was, which was interesting. I just want to mention the human side of this I, and then jump to a bit where we are now in human genetics. So as we heard this morning, we're now able to target, sequence, and measure the length of telomeres at the base pair level, at the base pair resolution, and even capturing the methylation. This is what Carol Greider talked to us about this morning. This is within nine or 10 years, we've gone to a point where going from being able to do the easy genes to doing the really complicated genes. 
Moreover, the really, really challenging genes, like SNN1 and 2, which are known to be in the dark genome, we now have ways of resolving those. So the, dif the difficulty with this genome, or with this part of the genome, is that there are duplications and SVs, and, other S and there are only one SNV that's different between SMN1 and SMN2. So it's really hard to resolve. Um, but we now have tools that can enable us to do that, um, and they will be coming out in epitome soon. Another equally challenging gene is the CYP2D6 gene, which is involved in pharmacogenomics. Um, it's really important because it is responsible for metabolizing a lot of the drugs that we have. And right now, with current met methodologies, you need a lot of assays to be able to resolve it. But we've developed a tool called Chinook that can now resolve CYP2D6, uh, CYP2D6, even this one here, which is a pseudogene, a fusion gene, and a duplication all in one. So some of you might be thinking, are you really only going to talk about human genetics? And no, I'm not, because very early on, we knew that long nanopore reads would be really ideal for microbial and metagenomic assays. So this was one of the first um, metagenomic results that we got. And I wonder how many of you know what this is, probably quite a few. So this is known as a dot plot, and we use it to look at how comparable genomes are. So if you have a newly assembled genome, you can compare it to a known reference, or you can compare two genomes to each other. If you have a dot on this diagonal line, or it lines up, it means that the genomes are fairly similar. So if you're doing metagenomic assembly, you want to look for uh, this diagonal line. And this is known as a mag. So we wanted to do an example again of showing how we could generate these mags. This is back in 2015. And we needed to find a sample uh, that would be a good showcase for this. And we wanted to find something, again, that had impact in the real world. So we decided to go for unpasteurized milk. Now, back then, and even now, unpasteurized milk is actually illegal to sell in the state of New York. Luckily, there are some people who come into the city and sell it. It's known as moonshine. So, Late one evening, I went to a truck that came in from the suburbs to buy unpasteurized milk. Some of it we grew overnight, and some of it we just extracted DNA from directly. And then um, we went through the, the pipeline at the time called WIMP, or What's in My Pot. And you know, we found a lot of different, dif different organisms, including a few that are known to be involved with mastitis in cows. We also assembled them and got uh, a few contigs. And one of them is what I showed before, is this is a whole genome. It's a single contig and a whole genome. Now, back in 2015, assembling a whole genome from a metagenomic sample, I mean, we were ecstatic. It felt like we had really gotten something here. It was just great. Again, in hindsight, it's a manual process, and it's probably not that ideal that you just get a random genome out, and you don't really know if it's one that's interesting. So if we fast forward again to now, there are lots of things that have happened. One, we now have a fecal reference community, so basically a standard community that has hundreds of, of mags or of genomes in there that we can use. And equally important, we now have tools, so community-generated tools that help us look at these, um, this med these metagenomic samples in a, you know, really high complexity. So what we've done now is working with um, the, the reference community and our new base called the sub V5 that was released today. And we were able to generate many, 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 many more mags. So on one promethine flow cell, we have almost 100 mags. Now, this is one mag to 100 mags in nine years. I think that's pretty impressive. Similarly, using semi bin 2, uh, we, now have, we can now get up to 400. Uh, mag bins from one flow cell. But it's not just generating genomes, it's also the biology that is enabling. In these samples, there are some species that have more than one strain. In fact, in a in a, if a species is present at about 1% abundance of all the reads, there's a 70% chance that there's one than more, more than one strain in there. And now we can start to look at interesting biology. So if you look at a, here a dot plot of two, these two different strains from the same species, we actually see that there is a 150 KB deletion in one of them. 
And interestingly, that deletion includes an AMR gene. So in the same sample, we have two strains from the same species, and one has an antibiotic, antibiotic resistance. Similarly, we can look at the modifications. Remember that these are native uh, reads, and we can always have modifications present. So here we're looking at two strains from the same Clostridia species. They're using the same uh, motif, methylation motif, the CATC, uh, sorry, GATC, but one methylates 6MA, and one methylates the C in 5MC, with 5MC. So again, the sequence is almost identical, but the methylation is different. And this is two strains in the same sample. I think this is where we're really starting to see this field go. So we have true multi-omics in metagenomics here. We've actually also sequenced a, a flow cell of RNA from the same sample. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it, but there, we got 230 million cDNA reads. Um, and we're looking into the biology of that to make it truly multi-omic. So this, I think, is really the forefront of multi-omics metagenomics, and it's really enabled by the community and by the tools you're generating and all the wonderful work you're doing. Now, I really tried to make a clever transition to the next slide, which is taking us back to uh, 2016, but I, don't, I think I'll let the video speak for itself. <laughs> So some of you uh, might remember Yan Yang. So she's now in the support team, but she started in the applications team. And this is the first time ever that we generated one gigabase of data from a midnight and flow cell. And this is March 2016. This was really enabled by a new pore and a chemistry change from the platform team. Um, and it just opened up a breadth of new application, given the higher accuracy and the higher throughput. It, at London Calling in 2016 was the first time we showed whole human genome sequencing. Um, it took quite a few flow cells, but we got there. Um, and it really enabled us to access new parts of the genome that we hadn't been able to access before. Some of that was repeat expansions. Already back then, we were able to sequence through repeat expansions, and we were able to count the repeat expansions down to a 5% accuracy. But again, thinking that of that in hindsight, it was a very manual process. Like, you literally have to align things up and count them. Um, and then fast forward to today, counting repeat expansions is just like any other variant. We have um, Straggler, that was a community-developed tool. It's now incorporated in the epitome um, human variation workflow. And counting repeats is now just a click of a button. Again, I want to highlight that moving forward, I think we're going to move into a more, uh, even more biology-driven aspect of this. So not only counting the repeats, but looking at the individual motifs. So using another community tool, TRViz, which is also going to be incorporated into the epitome human variation workflow, we can now look at things like um, motif switches. So this is a, the gene called RFC1. And in this gene, one allele is expanded. The unexpanded allele uses one motif, but the expanded allele uses another motif in, for the expansion. And again, I think this is really going to drive a lot of biological insight and looking not only at how long are repeats, but looking at what's happening in there at the base resolution level. For the last time, I'm going to go back in time, uh, this time to 2020 or 2021. So like most of you, we were sequencing, sequencing a lot of SARS-CoV-2 at that time. I'm not going to talk about that here. What I will talk about is cell-free DNA. We were lucky enough to be able to take a blood sample from our CTO, Clive Brown. Um, and it, although it was in the middle of the pandemic, he was happy to let us do that, to look for cell-free DNA. As many of you may know, cell-free DNA is in the blood, and you can access it from doing a normal blood sample. Diseased cells tend to die off more quickly than non-diseased cells, so you have a slier, slightly higher level of, dise of diseased cell-free DNA than non-diseased. From short resequencing, we all thought that all cell-free DNA was really short. But when you look at it with a device that doesn't care about what read length you have, you just sequence all that's in there, we found that many of the reads were actually longer. So they, the cells are bound to nucleosomes, and in between the nucleosomes, degradation will happen, or nucleosomes will, uh, nucleases will cut. So we know that a lot of the reads have the right, the signs of, around the size of a nucleosome, but many of them are much bigger than that. 
And that might, be, that might have a biological impact, which is called fragmentomics. We also have methylation in these reads because they're native and not amplified. And we also looked at the cell-free RNA, as we heard about from Dr. Kim this morning. The last thing we did with, the, with these samples back then was to look at nucleos nucleosome positioning. So that can be a proxy for gene expression, because if you have open chromatin, you're more likely to have transcription factors bind. And again, I think this was the first time we looked a, looked a bit into doing multi-omics on this type of sample. But we're going to fast forward now to right now, where we're looking at this type of work again. Not cell-free DNA, but this time whole genome. And we're doing something that we're calling uh, chromatin stenciling. So in the cells, we extract the nuclei, and everywhere where chromatin is open, we label it with M6A. We then continue to do a normal extraction and a normal read um, library prep, and this is the sequencing result we get. We have around an N50 of 31 KB. Now, I get you're all probably thinking, well, what happens to all the variants, or all the variant calls, if you add 6MA over the entire genome? And this slide is to show you that nothing really happens with it. So SNPs, indels, SVs, phasing, and methylation all have the same high accuracy as we're used to. So this is adding another level of variance, really. So the M6A is now functioning as a way to tell us which part of the genome is open. And to test how well it worked, we looked at three different genomic features that we, are, that we know should have open chromatin. So there's the transcription factor binding site, there's the DNAs1 hypersensitivity regions, and then there's the transcription start sites. All these three sites are known to be places where you would expect open chromatin for the proteins to be able to access it. And what we see is that we have high 6MA calling in those regions, and this is at a global level. We then had to see if this actually worked and if it gave any meaning to us, what the results that we found. So I'm going to show you an IGV plot. This is my last IGV plot, but it's also the most complicated one, so I'll try and walk you through it. This chromosome 16, we have about a 68 KB region that we're looking at. And there are two genes on here. There's the CNF597, and then there's a long version that go from NAA60, and then there's a short version of NAA60. All three of these genes have a promoter at the beginning. We have haplotype-specific SNPs, luckily, so we're able to phase all the reads. The reads have the red as the M6A, and there are tracks for both 5NC and M6A. And lastly, we have some cDNA reads that we made as well. So the thing to look out for here is this region. So there's two promoters, one for each of the genes here. You'll notice that the haplotype one has high 6MA and low 5MC, meaning that the chromatin is open and the, the promoter region is available for transcription. And what we see is that we have cDNA reads from uh, both genes there. Now, the haplotype 2, we have low 6MA, meaning the chromatin is closed, and we have high methylation, meaning that the promoter is probably also closed off, and we see no cDNA reads. Now, the short form of 6MA has the same for both haplotypes. It has, no six, or it has high 6MA, so open chromatin, and then it has uh, no 5MC, which is why we're expecting to have expression there, and we see cDNA reads. So this, I think, is really an amazing multiomics opportunity that we have here to look at SNPs, SVs, methylation, open chromatin as a proxy for cDNA reads, and all of those things in one assay. And I know I bang on about this a lot, but one promethine flow cell, you get whole genome sequencing, you get all of the variants, and even a proxy for cDNA. And this is hinting to what Gordon said this morning, we really do have uh, a, a platform that can give you all these variants in one at a very high accuracy. So with that, I hope I've given you a bit of a, a tour through the last 10 years, uh, an idea about what we're, what's happening now, and even more so an idea about what I think will be happening in the future. I really think these multi-omics assays, both in microbial and in human, and in cancer, and in uh, plants, and in animals, and everything else, is going to be what, the, what we're working towards. None of this would be possible without an amazing team. Uh, the applications team is now global. 
We have labs in Alameda in San Francisco, in New York, in Oxford, and out in Singapore. And then we have people spread out remotely as well. We're really keen to chat. We're really keen to work together. We want the community to function as one big group. Um, please come and chat to us if you have any good ideas. There's a couple of us represented here. Um, we really want to learn with you guys, and we want to hear what you're thinking about doing and try to see if we can enable that as well as possible.